Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Geoffrey mm -hmm. Grinton, and I'm chairperson of the Eastern Suburbs Regional Group of the Victorian Branch of the Order of Australia Association. Really glad that you could join us for the second of our webinar session. In a moment, I'm going to invite Glennis to introduce our speaker, Wendy Moore. But I just want to say thank you to, to Wendy for being with us. So I think without further ado, I'm going to invite Glennis, if you'd like to introduce our speaker, Wendy Moore. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, Geoffrey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Wendy Moore. Wendy is going to talk to us about her wonderful project to empower the women of Nepal, helping them escape violence, exploitation, and poverty. But first, here's a little bit about Wendy herself. Wendy and I are friends. You see. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy lives in Canberra with her husband, Malcolm. She has three delightful grandchildren, is a keen gardener, and as she says, she hears better than she did years ago. And she may explain that remark later. Wendy is also an artist and teacher who specializes in jewelry designing for over 20 years. For the last 15 years, Wendy has been involved with the Samyanat Nepal, a non-government organization set up to support women in Eastern Nepal who are victims of violence. The project has been a real success due to the courage, resilience and creativity of the Nepalese women and also, of course, to Wendy's determination and dedication. In 2020, Wendy received an Order of Australia for her work in Nepal. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please join with me in welcoming Wendy Moore. Thank you, Wendy. Oh, thanks very much, Glennis. It's, um, thank you very much for inviting me. This is by far the biggest Zoom meeting I have ever attended. Um, and I just, uh, I don't do talks a lot, but I do love talking about these women in Nepal because I think that so often the news we get is, is sad and overwhelming and all about problems and that it's just really nice sometimes to hear about something that's positive uh, where people are being empowered and going on to empower other people so thank you very much um, as Glennis said I do hear better than I heard even three years ago um, I had a cochlear implant um, just after COVID started and uh, so that's made a, a huge difference and means that later on I will be able to take questions if you have any. So yeah, thank you. So yes, look, I'm, I'm calling this talk a colourful journey because I think uh, that's what will come across. Nepal is a very colourful and vibrant country and, and the, the women who live there um, are certainly on a, on a pretty amazing journey. Um, just very, very quickly, a little bit about me. Um, I worked in health for many decades. I mainly worked in the area of brain injury rehabilitation. And then um, when my husband and I moved to Nepal, I thought, right, this is when I'll focus on my sort of creative interest. That was the plan. And so I, I'm a mixed media artist. I mainly make jewellery. I also make wearable or semi-wearable things and really everything I make is pretty much um, a celebration of being alive because it's something I don't take for granted at all for various reasons. Um, so yeah, that's that's me. I My mum and dad took my sister and me to Nepal in 1975 so it hadn't been open for very long and um, I was a, a sort of a surly, reluctant teenager who really wanted to go on the beach holiday. And my parents, who were just sort of mad keen bushwalkers, said, no, no, we're going to do this. So we headed over there and um, I just had this really interesting feeling as we landed in Kathmandu Airport. I just had this sort of amazing sense of coming home. And I've landed in Kathmandu Airport 
I've lost count, maybe 40 or 50 times. And every time I still have that sense of coming home. So um, the link is strong. Um, I, I went back, we took our kids when they were 11, uh, 10 and 11. And it was on that trip in the 90s that Mal and I thought we'd really love to come back here and work. It was a country that we we loved a lot. We'd fallen in love over slides of Nepal. Um, and so we started to think about what we could do and how we could make that work. And I'm sure some of you have been to Nepal and, and possibly know a lot about it, but it's, a, it's an extraordinarily beautiful country, geographically very beautiful, sandwiched between China and India. So up the top near China is the Himalaya, which is what people particularly associate with Nepal. Then there's the hilly region in the middle where a lot of the people used to live. And then there are the plains, the Terai down near India. And, and when we imagined what we were going to do, we had ourselves living in some sort of fabulous little hill village. But in fact, we, we were closer to the Terai, to the plains. The, um, the geography of Nepal is what makes it a really difficult country to live in. So for anyone living in that hilly region, even now the roads are, are pretty dreadful. It's very difficult to get health care. It's very difficult to have a good education. It's a very new democracy. So it, it, it's still, you know, just really working out what to do. Corruption is endemic. Um, the, 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 you know, there are things like the earthquakes, um, the employment is absolutely appalling. So most Nepalis, the, the greatest source of income from Nepal is remittances from overseas. So huge numbers of Nepali people, young people work in the Saudi states. And, and this has had a you know, massive impact on, on the culture and, and family life. So it's a really tough country to live in. And it's even more tough if you're a woman. Um, so for women in Nepal, th there's a number of reasons. I was thinking, you know, why is it so especially tough? And if you're a woman in Nepal, you are, you're dependent on a man from the second you're born. So when you're born and a child, you're dependent on your father. When you marry, you are dependent on your husband. And then as an older person, you are dependent on your son. So you'd better have a son. <laughs> So that's why there's this real um, emphasis on, on the male child, on having, on having sons. Because of poverty, if, if, you're, um, if you have a, fa a large family, you'll educate the boys first. So if you're a girl, you're much less likely to have an access to education. You're much less likely to know what your rights are. And it's just, you're, you're probably, reading you're probably not able to read as much as the males in the country and and unfortunately it there's sort of a community tolerance of, of domestic and social violence so if if a woman goes to her parents and says look I'm in this abusive situation I need to leave there's almost a pressure to not just to not rock the boat because if you leave your marriage you're probably stuffing up the prospects of your sisters to get partners. And if your sisters don't get married, your parents have got to keep supporting them and they can't do that. So there's this quite significant society pressure to just put up and shut up, really. Um, I mentioned a bit about the attitudes to having a son. So my husband was asked several times whether he thought about getting a second wife because I hadn't been able to deliver anything more than two daughters. So, um, you know, it was, it was still a thing <laughs> that the thing that's changing now is that so many of the men are going overseas and it's the, the girls who are having to do the looking after. So I think maybe some of those attitudes are changing. Um, most marriages in certainly outside Kathmandu are still arranged marriages. Um, and arranged marriages can be great, many happy arranged marriages, but it also means that sometimes people can be tricked, the women are tricked into a marriage situation, um, and that, yeah, that, that can be very vulnerable. And finally, bigamy, which 
was actually illegal, has been illegal since the 60s, but the enforcing of that law is pretty slack. So many of the women that that we see, um, their husbands have started a new family and that's it. They've no longer got any support. So um, they're sort of the main reasons why it's pretty, pretty tough to be a woman in Nepal. Um, and the, these two ads, these were great big signs on the east-west highway that ran along the, the Terai. And they're basically warning women and families. Um, and this, I think I use this phrase sort of every week when we lived over there, if something looks too good to be true, it probably is. Often a family would be approached, someone would come and say, look, we've got this great fellow that that you know your daughter might marry um this is you know the situation and you know they're very poor they're they're looking for someone to sort of um <laughs> look after their daughter and so they go into it the other situation is with uh jobs someone might be offering a really attractive job and then that would often end up being trafficking so this sign was very much warning about trafficking um so Samanat, Samanat was started not by me, it was started by a group of Nepali people who were working in trafficking and in the field of, of domestic violence. And they just, they realized that rescuing these women just wasn't enough, that if they rescued the women, they were still very, very vulnerable. And so they wanted to empower them to, to be able to live independently. And they also wanted to give them a hand up, you know, helping them out rather than, than you know, sort of doing everything and creating another kind of dependence. So Kopila Busnet, who's in the light blue, is a lawyer. And I always think of her as the heartbeat of Samanat Nepal. I also think of her as my sister, but she, she and these friends all chipped in and, um, and got this organization going. And, and so what it does is, is basically women approach the organization when they're, they're vulnerable. And we, we have tailor-made pro programs. So, you know, it's, it's not like a great one size fits all. We really uh, talk to the women about what it is that they need. So for most women, it's, it's legal support. So it's helping them understand what their rights are, what they're entitled to, uh, helping them to get, actually get a divorce if that's what they want, helping them to have access to their, any compensation that they're um, able to get. We also, um, they learn sustainable ways to get an income. So nearly all the women do local um, income generation training. So things like um, selling milk from a dairy cow or tailoring. Tailoring is very, is a really good one. Um, some of the women have small vegetable gardens and they sell, sell vegetables. Bakery is becoming a big item in Nepal, making cakes and, and things like that. So um, the other thing that happens is we, we offer counselling, there's short-term accommodation if that's needed, but there's just now that because it's been going for so many years now, there's this fabulous sort of groundswell of, of mentoring from the women who've been through the program. So it's, um, it really is a, a sisterhood and just something, you know, pretty, pretty wonderful to watch. Um, and then I've got here, we also write sex education books, which was something that we didn't necessarily plan, but um, it happened. So, you know, when you, when you meet every week for 15 years, there's kind of not much that you, you don't talk about. And uh, we covered a lot of ground, the ladies and me. And the women realised that one of the, the reasons that they're very vulnerable is because of their lack of knowledge about themselves, about their bodies. And um, they just, they desperately didn't want their kids to be so vulnerable, particularly their daughters. Quite a few of them didn't really know how they got pregnant. And they just thought that that was a situation they didn't want to happen again. So they, um, we talked about talking to your children about sex. And I said, well, look, it's hard for any parent to do that. It's not just a Nepali thing. 
And I said, you know, in Australia, we sometimes use books to help us talk about it, blah, blah, blah. And so we thought, oh, you know, we'll, we'll have a look and see if there are some books. And Kathmandu is 600 kilometres away, but when a couple of us were in Kathmandu, we had a look at what was around and there was really nothing. It was just, you know, like um, biology textbooks and that was it. So these amazing women decided that they needed to write the book that they needed. And so um, we did, we, we wrote this book called uh, Bibuti Wonders, How Babies Are Made. And this was for kids sort of up to eight years old. And a um, darling friend of mine in Broken Hill did the pictures. And it. I often think this is one of the most quietly subversive things we've done because the women did this, but there were messages here like, if you look at the picture in the top row in the middle, the, the doctor there is a woman. So that that's kind of, you know, us saying, look at this, look at this, this woman can be a doctor. Um, the woman is having a baby in hospital, which is another, you know, kind of strong health message. The baby that's born was a girl and her father was really happy about it. So just all these little messages that we put in this book. If you look at the picture on the, um, the bottom left, that's, that's, we anguished over this it went past so many test panels about you know the sex scene so this this was the sex scene so they're looking long and lovingly into one another's eyes and that's kind of about it but this book was snatched up we um we're almost I think we're about to do our second reprint but we heard that high schools were buying it and we thought this is not good because this book is for five to eight year olds so we then um, sort of girded our loins and started on the next volume, which is What's Happening to Me. And this was for kids in high school. And um, again, the same kind of quiet subversion is going on, but, but many school districts have um, really encouraged us with this project. And so this book is, is, has been purchased by schools and um, it's written in Nepali and English because education takes place in English and we had to have it in English so it would sell to schools. So yeah, I'm super proud of them. Um, we Originally we, we had a rented building. I've always had this sort of big thing about NGOs not having property and lots of stuff but we realized that we did need to have our own building because um, more and more women were actually needing accommodation. And so with the help of the Paul McClay community, the international community, we did a stack of fundraising and built, um, got some land and built our beautiful building, which um, was finished just before the earthquake and did stay standing. So that was really good. <laughs> um, but it, it contains our studio where we do, where we make the jewelry. Um, we have three little tiny um, shops that people can rent for sort of peppercorn rent to start their businesses. We have a microfinance cooperative in there. Um, we have a big meeting room so that people can get together and we sort of have people coming and talking on community, you know, topics of interest to the community. Um, we did have a creche up until COVID, but because we're sort of often having people quarantining, that's now being turned into um, like a, a quarantine sort of centre. Um, so it's been really good. Having our own building has made a huge difference. And um, I think it's improved the status of the women in the community. When the, the microfinance cooperative started, people were, you know, kind of pretty wary of it. And it was, we struggled to get the 30 people we needed, but I think now we've got nearly a thousand people in that. So that's been good. Um, just to talk a little bit about how the, the women heard about polymer clay. In the beginning, the, the women were trying to look at something that they could do to generate their own in th their own funds for the program. So there's no government funding. And they were in, in Nepal, women wear beautiful necklaces made out of seed beads when they're married. And so they were thinking about making some jewelry out of the seed beads. And um, it was at that point that Kopila met me. We were, um, we were living in someone's house while we were 
working out where to live. And Coppola saw me doing some polymer clay work and she said, oh, you know, could you teach that to my ladies? And I said, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I said, I don't think this would really work. But I said, I'll help you with the, the seed bead stuff. You know, we can look at making some lovely jewellery and we can take it to a fair trade organisation and da-da-da. So we did that. We made lots of lovely jewellery. We took the bus to Kathmandu and showed them our jewellery. And the fair trade organisation pretty much said, yeah, everyone does that. You're going to have to do something different. And I was wearing something, surprise, surprise. And they said, look, if you could do something like that, we'd buy that. And so I thought, okay, I've got to get over myself here um, and we just need to have a crack at, at doing this. So Copula and I decided we'd give it 12 months, um, see how we go, whether or not we can get the polymer into Nepal. They don't have ovens in that part of Nepal. There were all these reasons why it was going to be, you know, a bit of a challenge to say the least. Um, and we did it. And so I, I love the photo on the right. I hope it, I don't know whether it's visible, but the sign as you go into this bus says, oh my God, save me. And it was pretty much what I would think whenever I got on a bus in Nepal. So I lived about three hours away from where the ladies are. And so every second week I'd catch the bus and that trip would be anything between three and eight hours. And I would go to the, the place where they lived and then I'd stay for the week and we'd do the training and all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so it sort of became my second home in Nepal. And, and this is some of the jewellery they make. This is actually, if the best way people can support Samanat is to buy the jewellery. The, the women just love the fact that the the funding for the program comes from something that they do. So the, um, they, they get their own income. It's run like a social entrepreneurship sort of model. Um, and the, the really exciting thing that's happened during COVID is that an American polymer clay artist is collaborating with us to make some pretty amazing jewelry. We have two Zoom meetings a week it's midnight for her and one o'clock in the afternoon for me and nine o'clock for them and so it's this sort of big um three nation uh zoom where the women learn these fabulous skills so these are some of our gorgeous girls with some of their lovely creations um i just thought i'd very quick quickly tell you a couple of stories of, of of the ladies just to give you a bit of a sense of how how we work um Gita in in this page is she's our quality control queen so she's now been making jewelry for 15 years she's just fantastic she's quite happy to tell me when I'm not up to speed um and and her story is just amazing so Gita and her daughter um were living with her parents-in-law so when women marry in Nepal they always go to live or nearly always go to live with their in-laws and her husband had gone to um, one of the Arab countries to work which is what often happens and she was very fond of his parents and looked after them and then in their old age they died and when they died she got a message from him more or less saying well you know I've remarried I have another family you can we don't need you anymore almost and so she was left with nothing, nothing to educate her daughter, nowhere to live. So she came to Samanat and um, initially was given assistance to work out what she was entitled to. So she was able to get a small amount of land, like really small amount of land, but a bit of land. Um, she was able to get a divorce, then started doing some income generation training. And she's a fabulous artist. So yeah, she's, she's been doing that for many years. And she's now a member of our board. So our board is made up of um, I think it's 70% women and 60% of them have all been through the program, which I think is fantastic. Um, and she, Selena, her daughter is now 17 or 18 and, and they're both just these fabulous feisty women who will um, encourage women when they come in and, and really, really help them. So um, yeah, that's Gita. 
um, Sita has, uh, her story again was one that was reasonably typical. She had decided to stay in an abusive situation because her daughter was in her final year of school and she was concerned that if she left, her daughter wouldn't be able to finish school. So she did that, but she also wanted to prepare for independence. So she um, took a loan from the microfinance cooperative and bought herself a cow and set herself up a little business selling milk. And fortunately her cow had a calf. So she sold the calf and um, repaid her loan and then ended up buying two two cows. So she's someone else who's really, um, her circumstances have really improved. Uh, the other thing was when she came to us, we realized after she was really making a mess of the polymer clay that um, she just, she really couldn't see very much. So we were able to get her fitted with glasses, which she was very happy about. And then this last slide, you can all heave a sigh of relief. <laughs> um, this is, I just think this is a really important picture. This is um, a photo of a group of the women from our organization uh, who've just given a talk to a group of women from quite a remote village. And um, they, I guess for me, this, this sort of talk so much about empowerment and paying it forward. I think many of you will know that, you know, the, the aid and development world can become a bit of an industry. And um, certainly a lot of programs on human rights and advocacy are given, you know, by sort of middle-class people from Kathmandu who charge an arm and a leg to come out to the regions and do this. But what we've discovered is that all those programs are so much better and so much more powerful if they're run by women who've experienced that sort of empowerment. So, so these, these women have gone out to this village and said, you know, you, you don't have to live like this, that, you know, together we can improve the situation. And, and they'd just given, they'd all donated 50 rupees each, and none of these women are rich at all, um, to this small group, just as a way of saying to them, you know, you're not alone. We, you know, what we can achieve together is something really powerful. So, um, yeah, to me, that's just one of those pictures that uh, just always makes me feel, yeah, very, very inspired. That's it <laughs> with the pictures. Um, and I'm sorry if I've gabbled, <laughs> but um, yeah, if anyone has questions, I'd be really happy to answer them. Well, thank you so much, Wendy. It's uh, fascinating as well as uh, inspiring and interesting. There'll be a few questions, I'm sure, but let, let me kick it off. You said at one point that women approach the organisation when they're vulnerable, mm. but how do they know about the organisation? Well, that, that's a really fantastic question, Jeffrey, especially because it's one of the things I forgot. Um, <laughs> but we... When we didn't have a building, that was a real problem because we moved around and so it was kind of a word of mouth thing and people then had to sort of discover, well, where's Samana now? And, and there was also a great deal of shame associated with approaching the organisation. If you came to us, you know, that was pretty bad. So having a building with a great big sign in the community was, was really important. A really effective way of letting people know we existed was radio programs. So in Nepal, many, many people listen to the radio. So you could have these little kind of drama things that people learn about. Um, by far the biggest way has been word of mouth. Copula does a lot of talks. So she's the sort of go-to person in the district about you know, women's issues. So, so people, people, a lot more people know about us now and it's, but there's such a lack of services. So we, one of the girls that we work with, we were able to get her some training, some psychosocial counselling training. She's the only person with that training in the Eastern half of Nepal, which is just ridiculous. <laughs> but, you know, so there's, there's, there should be something like us in every district, but unfortunately, there's not. 
Oh, thank you, Wendy. That was super. Thank you for sharing that with us. And there's so much wonderful work you've done. Um, just a minor thing, where can you procure the jewellery from? Is oh, it well, that, <laughs> that's another fabulous question. <laughs> uh, we have a website, um, www.summernut.co. So it's S-A-M-U-N-N-A-T dot co. And we have a shop. Um, we also have, there are a number of places that, because originally we only had wholesale things, if any of you are near Lock, there is a wonderful shop in Lock called Yakety Yak that sells our jewellery. The Royal Children's Hospital used to have some. Um, but, yeah, so on our website we do have a list of all the stockists uh, and the new jewellery uh, will be being launched at the end of this month. And um, that's really special. So, so, you know, if you're interested, have a look. Yeah. Thank you. So I've got a question here from uh, Hattis. He thanks you for the presentation. What's the interaction between religion and the type of activities that this particular organisation is involved in? He comments um, that in some countries, there's quite a strong negative reaction from religious authorities. Well, look, I think not, not particularly religion. Early on, some of the people in the community would say to Copula, you know, you're undermining the fabric of society because, because she was helping women to become divorced. You know, some of the people would say, you know, this is breaking the fabric of society. But I think for women now, they, they were realising that staying in in these situations that was undermining it too and I think by far the biggest impact for Nepal at the moment is all these people working overseas I think that's kind of a experiment in progress to see what that does to family society kids who don't see their dads for three years that kind of thing so look Nepal has gone from being a Hindu monarchy to being uh, you know a democracy over a, a relatively short time. Um, it's mainly Hindu. There is um, there's a, a reasonable Buddhist and a small Muslim community. So yes, it's been more. I think it's been more from just a general society sense that that some of some people have said, oh, you know, and that was certainly early on. It's not happening so much now. Uh, Wendy, thank you. Uh, what sort of population in, in the the area that you're um, based and what's the is there any intention to move further afield in uh, in the Nepal? yeah look i'm not actually sure about the population it is fairly densely populated so nepal itself is about 20 27 28 million so it's similar to australia I think it's five to six million in Kathmandu. So Kathmandu is hugely populated. We, we're just a sort of a big highway town. And I suppose, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting question. I, I think we've decided that we'd rather work deep rather than wide. We, we sort of would rather do the job properly in a, in a smaller area rather than kind of spread our services too thinly and and certainly you know if other people talk to us about you know what what we do we'd be really happy to do that but I think I, I think it would be at the cost of what we do if we kind of tried to get too big. Thanks Wendy. There, there are obviously a number of uh, groups from Australia doing similar things to yourself over there. Is there any link between those groups to sort of get a you know a critical mass of something going yeah look i think there's we were really keen not not to reinvent the wheel and i suppose the other thing that we i mean when we moved over there the thing that we really wanted to do was look at something that was actually that came from a nepali community so i think something that was truly grassroots that you know, so I always say to people, I did not start this group. It was my profound good fortune to meet these women because I think the community themselves knew what they needed most of all, really. So the other thing is that we, where we are, Frank, is, is a long, long, long way out of Kathmandu. So we, 
when we were finishing our time in Nepal, we were the, my husband and I were the only two Westerners in the place. So a lot of the, the sort of Australians working in Nepal were living in Kathmandu or sort of closer to there. So, you know, I think you tend to be aware of each other. And certainly there are a couple of organisations, Project Didi and Asha Nepal, that we have really close links with um, and they had Australian involvement. So we've kind of helped one another. They've helped with training and things like that. So there's a little bit but I think because it was really more of a grassroots thing, they were more connecting with other Nepali groups. <laughs> uh, Wendy, thank you so much for your talk. I've had a bit to do with Cambodia and mm -hmm. the medical situation, the uh, looking after ill people is virtually non-existent. What it's like where well, where you are, you haven't mentioned anything about medical care and things like that. What's it like? I think there'd be a lot of similarities. Where my husband worked, he it, it used to be a British army camp. Everyone's probably heard about the Gurkha soldiers. So it used to be a British army camp that recruited the Gurkha soldiers. And um, when the, the British army left, they turned it into a hospital. And so it was a 700 bed teaching hospital and the care there was, was good. I used to think, okay, if anyone, anything went wrong, I'm kind of glad I'm here. But the problem is that there is no, you pay for everything in Nepal with healthcare. So if you're getting an injection, you have to pay for the, the syringe as well as the serum and the patient party, they talk about the patient party. So if you're in hospital, your family are there feeding you and cleaning you. And I'm sure it would be the same in Cambodia. So, so many times we saw people who, you know, lost their kids simply because they couldn't afford to pay for the treatment. So you pay for everything. The pharmacists, that's what they sell. You go off and you get that. So, so that's the really the inequity of healthcare in Nepal, that there are doctors, so many of them want to leave to go to America or Australia, but, you know, there were a few that were hanging on there and there were some really good doctors, but the resources are just so thinly spread. Uh, th thank you so much, Wendy. That was a wonderful talk. Oh. I, I do have very, very close friends who work with the organisation called FaZe. I don't know if uh, you interact with them in any way. It's oh, was that an organisation that worked with doctors? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. I think we had some people from FaZe who came out to the hospital at Tehran. So Malcolm, my husband, was doing more of the medical stuff. And I'm, I'm yes, I definitely know that name. We had the certainly the ambassador to Nepal when we lived there, um, Susan Grace was, um, she was terrific because we were so kind of off the beaten track and remote, you know, she would sort of give us a call every now and then and say, how's it all going? And it, I think people were surprised that our, our ambassador had sort of such a close awareness of the, the Australians that were in Nepal at the time, but yeah. yeah. Well, Wendy, it's been a, a, a really interesting uh, 45 minutes of listening to, to your story, to just hear how this developed, uh, how it started, uh, even though you didn't start it, you said? I didn't start um, it. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to hear something about it. Uh, the fact that these women are actually able to find a place for themselves to actually gain some independence and some uh, self-respect and an understanding of their place in society, the way they can contribute uh, to society at the same time as making sure that uh, the society recognises who they are, mm. has, has certainly been inspiring. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it's not, I always say it's, I feel very lucky that, that yeah. I met them. Oh, thank you very much, Jeffrey. Thank you.